Hi, I'm Mike Gilliam, and this is a slice of New York. Well, the holidays are here, and that means it's time to celebrate. People, in fact, come from all over the world to celebrate the holidays right here in New York City. It's a major slice of New York. We thought we'd take some time and kind of show you some of the better things to do this holiday season. Doesn't get much better than this, the windows at Macy's. So let's get to it. Talk to me a little bit about the windows. Did you like the windows? Yeah. <laughs> they were just a magical experience. It feels amazing just to be here. It's surreal. We're from the UK, just south of London. I think the windows are absolutely fabulous. Macy's is iconic, isn't it? For decades, the Macy's windows have been a big part of what makes the holidays special in New York City. And Hollywood agreed. Starting with the classic 1947 Miracle on 34th Street, set at Macy's and still a family favorite more than 75 years later. Would you please tell her that you're not really Santa Claus? That there actually is no such person? Well, I'm sorry to disagree with you, Mrs. Walker, but not only is there such a person, but here I am to prove it. This year's theme is Give Love, and Tiptoe the Reindeer is the star. We're following the story of our lovable reindeer, Tiptoe, and this year's theme is about her holiday festivities and everything she loves about the holidays. So she's celebrating this with her friends, the penguin and the polar bear. So as you go through each window, you follow her journey of her favorite holiday themes. We have dressing the tree, eating candy in the giant candy carousel, the fun house ornaments here window. We have playing music, dancing with the nutcracker window. And then finally, we have her in an advent calendar where people can sing their favorite holiday song. Coming up with the concepts and getting all of this constructed is a time-consuming task. We really started the process back in February, um, and really that's just to get the holiday windows going, um, and we want to start fabrication by March and April. The windows are fabricated in workshops away from the store. This year, they were built on Long Island. They build the entire window inside the workshop, um, with the craftsmen and artisans sculpting each individual piece, putting the window together there, testing it out, and then disassembling everything and putting it back in these windows. The window displays are part of history. Macy's has been celebrating the holidays with them since the 1800s. Some of the first windows are steam powered, so Macy's has been carrying this tradition since 1874. Back in the 1990s, we started trying to add more animation to the windows. Uh, Back in two, the early 2000s, we started doing a little bit more technology like LEDs, lights, lighting, and so on. So now we've come to the face of, of being more interactive with the windows as well. So every time we do windows, we want to build on one, upon what we've done before. Like a light show that they can take a photograph of them doing actually interacting with the window. Some of the windows feature interactive games. I liked how they're kind of like games and like you can take photos and it's just hilarious how the penguin pops out of nowhere. Others offer different types of interaction. We have our uh, window three that has a, a LED globe that creates a filter in your face that you can take away. We have our window four that has a keyboard that lights up playing a song when you press a button. And then we have our last window, interactive window, which is our um, app and calendar window, which is also our karaoke window, which you see yourself in the window while you're singing a song. And there are QR codes you can scan. So if you scan it, you get a, a filter of somehow. So we have like a reindeer filter, it gives you little cue horns, or we have a filter that you see tiptoe flying across the building. So it's different things. The interactive windows are getting rave reviews. They're so fun and interactive, like to be able to see people on the street and then see them inside, like the snow globe. It's fun, it's cute. Oh, I love the windows. As a matter of fact, the blue one is my favorite. I just took one with a picture and it it comes out with you on yourself, like a video. Yeah, when I walked by them, they were really cool with all the buttons and stuff. Yeah, I thought they were cool, like that big polar bear in there and then they had like the numbers and like it popped out or whatever and I saw the penguin, that was cool. And all of that ties into this year's theme of give love and being with friends and family. So, what do people visiting the windows think about this time of year? 
I think of Santa, presents, snow, Christmas trees, ornaments. Are you excited this year? Very. With me, it's about family. It's more about coming together and like being a, 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 a thoughtful of others that don't have and not, you know what I mean, as, as fortunate as you are. I think about uh, Santa Claus ringing bells on street corners and stores looking like Macy's. We don't do it as well as New York does it in London. We really don't. What's your message to New Yorkers who might see this and be thinking about, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it down there this year or not? You have to come and see the windows. OK, we're going to take a real fast break. And then when we come back, we'll go in studio and talk about some of the great things to do in New York City this holiday season. Well, New York is a very special place during the holidays. People come from all over the world to enjoy all that the city has to offer, while New Yorkers, well, they go all out to celebrate. This year, we're celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa all in the span of a month. You can feel the vibe in the city during the season, and there are lots of things to do that just don't exist in other places. A lot of what the city has to offer is steeped in history and tradition. We have a great group here to shine a light on all that is New York during the holidays. Lori Pickard is here from Free Tours by Foot New York City, along with Queensboro Community College Professor of History, Tim Keogh. We also have former Manhattan Borough historian, native New Yorker and CUNY graduate, Mike Michonne, and Rosalind Colgan from Time Out New York Magazine. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Rosalind, let's start with you first. Okay. What's your favorite thing to do in the holidays in New York City. And I bet it's around Rockefeller Center. Yes, it is. I mean, it's hard to pick because there are so many, but let's go with an icon, the Rockefeller Center tree. I go to see it every year, and this year it's it's a stunner. So it is here. It's a local tree. It's from Binghamton, New York. Um, it's 80 feet tall. It's 12 tons, and it's got that beautiful Swarovski star on top with millions of crystals. So it's really special. Yeah, that is something. I mean, where do you find a 12-ton Christmas tree? <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> well, there's a gardener, and it's his job, the Rockefeller Center gardener, his job to go around and scout for a tree. So he found this one, and it was a perfect fit. I, I read a story about that, and it said that he actually was out looking at the tree for last year yes. when he saw this particular tree, right? Yeah, exactly. And the family was very surprised. He drove up, said, can I take a look at your tree? They allowed him to do so, and it was it was the one. Laura, you have a little different perspective on all of this because you do the one walking tours. Tell us how that works. So our company is called Free Tours by Foot New York City and we're pay what you wish walking tours so the guests set the price of the tour. And we have a holiday lights tour and it starts at Bryant Park, goes over to Macy's, then up to Central Park in the plaza and then walks down Fifth Avenue and ends at Rockefeller Center. Oh, very cool. Now tell me about a walking tour. Um, is it a thing where, where people join that tour and they just kind of walk past, say hi, or, or take a look at, at whatever is there and just move on to the next spot? Or do they get a few minutes to, to spend time at each one of these exhibits? So uh, normally, it's a, it's a hi mo most of our tours are historic tours. So the guides are st storytelling. But with the Holiday Lights tour, you do get some of that historic perspective and time to take photographs. OK, mm -hmm. cool. Now, you know, it, it, wouldn't be right to really talk about Christmas in New York without going a little bit back. And that is, um, we have a big parade here that kind of kicks off the holiday season. And that parade, Mike, was not always called the Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? That's absolutely correct. It was called the Christmas Parade, the Macy's Christmas Parade. And Santa was the star as he is to this day, but it took place on Thanksgiving. So it's become sort of a Thanksgiving tradition. And it began in 1924. The employees of Macy's basically pushed for it, and the management thought it was a great idea. And so uh, they began the parade. It started very modestly, by the way. Mm -hmm. The first parade was circus animals, primarily as the big draw. Not circus animals, I should say animals. Right. And they were borrowed from the Central Park Zoo. Wow. Uh, <laughs> but after they ran the parade for a few years, uh, they found that, uh, that the children were frightened by some of the animals. So they, they made a big switch in 1927. That's when they started with the balloons. Okay. The first balloons were filled with air mm -hmm. after one year, and then the following year, 1928, they went with helium balloons. And um, they had a crazy tradition back then. For the first few years when they started using these helium balloons, 
at the end of the parade, they would release the balloons. Uh -oh. And they would go into the sky, and uh -huh. there was a method to the madness. Uh -huh. uh, if the balloons eventually would either deflate or burst, and they would land somewhere, somewhere <laughs> around, out on Long Island, in Queens, a lot of them, some of them literally drifted out to sea. But if you had a balloon that landed in your backyard, you would notify Macy's. There would be a card you could mail in, and they'd give you a reward. Wow. For, yes, they'd give you a reward for, 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 for finding their balloon. Uh, and this wacky, amazing tradition uh, came to an end when amateur pilots would try to snag the balloons in the sky. In midair? In midair. <laughs> and they did that a couple of times, except one time, uh, a pilot snagged a balloon and it ended up resulting in basically uh, like a death spiral. The plane was starting to crash, it, would lay, it was over Queens, a very uh -huh. populated area. Finally, the instructor took controls of the plane and managed to save it from crashing. But after that, they decided to stop releasing the uh, helium-filled balloons. <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, uh, Tim, Mike mentioned Santa, and that is the big draw with the Macy's Parade. I mean, that's the way they end that thing, and the holiday season is kicked off right then and there. Talk to me a little bit about the whole notion of the modern-day Santa Claus, though. Is that a New York thing? Yeah, it really is a New York invention. Um, of course, Santa, you know, St. Nicholas goes back centuries in Europe and, and Christian history. But our idea of Santa, you know, the, with the red suit and the beard and everything else, really is a 19th century invention. And it actually was very deliberate. Um, a merchant, prominent merchant named John Pintard, oh, he's the founder of the New York Historical Society. And he was talking a lot about um, trying to find some kind of like, you know, anti-English origins, uh, kind of anti-English kind of holidays to celebrate. Uh -huh. And the one he picked up on was the idea of St. Nicholas Day on December 6th. Um, so in 1810, he decided to celebrate St. Nicholas Day, and he had a uh, kind of wood c carving made, okay. and it showed a St. Saint Nicholas. Um, but this St. Nicholas wasn't as jolly as the one that we know. Uh, this St. Nicholas was kind of thin. Uh, and the Saint I was going to ask that. Yeah, yeah, thin, <laughs> kind of gaunt. Uh, and wow. apparently the St. Nicholas had two stockings, one that was filled with toys and one that was emptied. And St. Nicholas was kind of like a judgment day <laughs> to judge whether children are good or bad. Uh -huh. uh, so again, it wasn't so jolly. Um, However, say, um, John Pinder was friends with Washington Irving, we may know from Rip Van Winkle and uh, Sleepy Hollow. Uh -huh. And Washington Irving also wrote a story in 1819 uh, called Sketchbook, and he also described St. Nicholas, a little more jolly. And then from that, another friend of theirs, Clement Clark Moore, apparently, according to the telling, in 1822, wrote this poem, and it eventually became, of course, Twas the Night Before Christmas, the very famous poem. Wow. And that gave us the Santa Claus that we know. That we uh, have now. Yeah, exactly. I want to stick with you just a little bit, though, on this whole notion of Santa and New York City. One of the things that I found to be very neat in New York was the letters to Santa. That's kind of a New York thing as well, right? Yeah, so uh, there's a book by Alex Palmer called The Santa Claus Man. It's actually about his great-grand-uncle. Uh -huh. uh, and he was a bit of a, we'll call him entrepreneur. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and, That's and, a New York thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very money oriented. Yeah. And um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, John Duval Gluck Jr. was a uh, entrepreneur who helped found the Santa Claus Association. And one of Gluck's big projects was he he noticed that when children uh, mailed letters to Santa Claus in New York, it went to the post office and it went to a it got destroyed. Like the post office put them in a, a room and they destroyed it. They destroyed all the letters. So everybody was naughty at that point. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so sometimes the post office would ask if people wanted to answer the letters. Uh -huh. And uh, eventually he decided, I'm going to found an organization. We're going to kind of organize this and we're going to answer the letters. Mm -hmm. And over the course of 15 years, they answered a quarter of a million letters. And wealthy New Yorkers would sometimes volunteer to buy some of the gifts and deliver them. And, um, you know, it really kind of became this tradition of this letters and the letters being answered. And, and the companies in New York, Macy's and others, got involved, and it became a pretty big thing. Rosalind, there are some other things out there that, that you really enjoy during the yes. holiday season? I have a couple of gingerbread activities I want to talk about. Okay. So the first one is actually the world's largest gingerbread village. It is here in New York. It's at Chelsea Market. You can visit it for free during market hours. How big is large? Uh, a thousand. A thousand gingerbread houses as well as it's a village. So you'll see gingerbread bakeries, gingerbread pizza shops, gingerbread dance studios, anything that would be in a village 
is in this gingerbread village. Um, and it's made by someone local. He's from Queens, John Levitch, AKA the gingerbread man. Um, and he's already making next year's gingerbread display because that is how long this takes. And then the second gingerbread display is at Museum of the City of New York. Um, and this one is part of Gingerbread NYC, the Great Borough Bake Off. So there were more than 20 bakers, both amateur and professionals, who entered in this. And you can see their amazing gingerbread creations. They really focused on iconic New York City buildings. So you'll see a Yankee Stadium. You'll see the Apollo Theater. All made out of gingerbread. All made out of gingerbread. Oh. Yeah, super creative. Um, and astonishing, the detail that these folks went to. So the winner this year, the judges selected, was Patty Pops. They're from Brooklyn. And they did a tribute to the 50th anniversary of hip hop that we've been celebrating all year here in New York City. So DJ Cool Herc is made out of gingerbread. Really? Yeah, he's there yeah. in front of the display. Um, Santa's there, he's got his Nikes on, he's going to deliver presents. It's super cute. Uh -huh. what, what's kind of your favorite, Tim? So every year, we, uh, my son loves trains. Uh -huh. So we end up going to Grand Central Station and the MTA store actually has that wonderful train That's setup. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. And my son just loves pressing the buttons and running around that. So it's kind of something we always stop at. Plus it's also warm, as we know, <laughs> in December in New York, it can be freezing. So to have that warmth of Grand Central uh, is really nice. So we always focus on that. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the neat things to do in New York City that have music involved in them, okay? And we'll also talk about some hidden gems. We'll be right back. One of the best things about celebrating the holidays in New York is all of the fantastic music the city has to offer, from traditional to contemporary to gospel and just about everything in between. It's all here with some of the best musicians and singers in the world performing. Now, Rosalind, your tour of like the holidays in New York included some music things, right? There's so much amazing music during the holiday season. Last year, I went to a show at Carnegie Hall, which you should definitely do this year. You can look up lots of holiday themed performances that they're having there. It's so special. Make a day out of it, make a date out of it, go to lunch, go to dinner. But I also want to give you sort of a party atmosphere for some, some fun contemporary music as well. Okay. Um, so there's a pop-up bar called Miracle, where you can really get into the holiday spirits, if I may. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> that was very nice. Thank, thank you, I love a pun. Um, but they, the music is so central to this place. So they're playing holiday music. They're blasting, actually, I should say, holiday music. There's lights, there's like disco ball style lights. They take over a bar this year. It's the Cabinet Mezcal Bar in the East Village, and it's turned into like a winter wonderland. There's presents on the ceiling. There's animatronic Santas. There's a Hanukkah display. Just decor everywhere. Lots of fun drinks, and that music is pivotal to the celebration. Super fun. Oh, wow. Very, very You can cool. do that all throughout the holiday season as well. Cool. There are also like gospel tours and things in Harlem, correct? There's a gospel performance December 23rd and 25th, mm -hmm. themed around the holidays. You know, I wanted to ask you about one other thing, Sure. Um, uh, Bryant Park's Winter yes. Village. That's mm -hmm. also a good place to kind of stop off and spend some Absolutely. time during the holidays, right? Yes, I love going there each year. So it's totally free to enter. You can go ahead and, and enjoy 180 kiosks this year. So these are shops where you can go and shop local. There's also a lot of great food. And they have a small business spot light this year so that's highlighting local minority owned businesses so a great place to do some holiday shopping they also have of course their ice skating rink so you can rent skates and buy a ticket to get on the ice they have a lodge where you can go and hang out and kind of warm up with some some hearty foods and some cocktails and enjoy watching the skaters and admiring the Christmas tree while you're hanging out there. It's really like a winter wonderland. If I'm not mistaken, can you skate for free if you bring your own skates? Yes, I believe that is still true. Yeah, yeah I don't have my own skates, sadly, but okay. yes, I think you can. You know, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other holidays that we're celebrating in December as well. And one of those is, of course, Kwanzaa. And in Harlem, they have like a celebration at the Apollo Theater. At the Apollo Theater. The Apollo Theater does a few things for the holidays, but yes, on December 30th, it's called the Regeneration, Regeneration Night. Night. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So it's song and dance and the spoken word. Uh -huh. yeah. For Hanukkah, there's a couple great events. There's um, two really pivotal menorah lightings that you don't want to miss. Um, there is sort of a, a bit of a debate between which is the biggest menorah. There's one in Manhattan and then one in Brooklyn, but you should go see both of them during um, during Hanukkah. I got to see the one in Manhattan last year. It's right outside of the Plaza Hotel. and 
they actually have like a crane that they use to, to bring someone up to light the menorah. That's how big it is. Wow. So it's really a spectacle to see. Is it a thing where we've just grown and grown and grown historically to, to the point where New York is the capital for Christmas or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know, the points I was making earlier, in many ways New York has always been the capital of modern Christmas. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, they say at least the first Santa in a retail store was in Macy's. Uh -huh. uh, I believe in 1851, if I get that right. Uh, the first lighted Christmas tree was in Madison Square, the original Madison Square, uh -huh. uh, 1912, if I'm getting that right. Um, so here has been the center of all these big public events. But one thing I wanted to keep in mind with music is the kind of ring-a-ling we always hear every year from the Salvation Army. Uh -huh. um, and of course, the Salvation Army really was established in New York in the 1890s. Uh, and the idea of that kettle that the Salvation Army, you know, they, they stand around and ask you to donate money to, that came from an Army, a Salvation Army captain in New York who uh, he had been a sailor previously. And when he had arrived in London, he used to notice that when they got off ships in, uh, outside of London, they had these kettles uh -huh. where they'd throw change in, and it was for the poor. He said, that's a great idea. And he brought it over to New York because the Salvation Army was growing rapidly in the 1890s. They had housing, they had uh, work programs, they really needed money for it. And so the kettle, you know, uh, uh, system with the, with the ring of the bell was a way to get a lot of money in to help uh, uh, kind of sustain the Salvation Army's early activities. Wow, and that's been going on that long? Oh, yes, yeah, since the 1890s, yeah. And, and it grew by eight, 1901, I want to say. They actually had, they rented out Madison Square Garden, the old Madison Square Garden. <laughs> 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 Which old Madison Square Garden? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they switched from getting donations from, they still got donations from regular people on the street, but they started getting donations from wealthier patrons. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they did is they had a massive Christmas dinner and they invited thousands of people to Madison Square uh, as well as the Grand Central Palace. Now is that somehow connected to the Bowery? Yes, uh, so the Bowery, uh, Salvation Army was in the Bowery, mm -hmm. but uh, there was also kind of local, local politicians very involved in giving and charity. Uh, and famous, of course, Tammany Hall, the, the Democratic uh, Party machine that kind of ran New York City. <laughs> Still influential in New York mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, <laughs> Um, one very famous local politician, Big Tim Sullivan, uh -huh. uh, was a famous Irish American politician who also ran big Christmas dinners uh, and also was known to give out free Christmas dinners to everyone. It was kind of an alternative to the kind of wealthy oriented Salvation Army that kind of you know, bestowed upon the poorest. Or he was among people in the Bowery and, and kind of providing uh, you know, good, healthy, and, um, you know, or at least hot meals, I should say. Maybe not healthy, but hot meals <laughs> uh, for Christmas for those in need. Hmm to sort of carry it over into the more modern times, let's not forget that Madison Avenue is a New York City concept, and Madison Avenue with advertisements has brought Christmas to the world, mm -hmm. uh, and the ideas, the visions, the look of Christmas uh, comes from commercials and advertisements, and creative people who generally originate and live in New York City. So we're, we're sort of broadcasting that that vision to the world. We've been doing it since, you know, basically since the days of radio um, and into the modern age. Yeah, yeah. let's talk about these hidden gems sure. now. Um, you know, we know about a lot of the things that are publicized out there, but do you have a couple of hidden gems that you guys like out there that we might want to share? I have one. So it's hard to say that, um, I guess anything with an elephant is hidden because they're gigantic, <laughs> but I do think that this holiday tree doesn't get as much attention as some of the others. It's at the American Museum of Natural History, and every year they have a thousand um, origami ornaments that are placed on their tree. Then this year they're focusing on elephants because that's their new exhibit. So there's going to be elephant ornaments, woolly mammoths, and then of course, you know, some of the classic dinosaurs, the blue whale. Um, but you can see this at AMNH if you head up to the Upper West Side, and I think it's really beautiful it's not you know quite as grand as an 80 foot 12 ton tree but it's still really special how about you Lori mine's an event that it's probably more for locals because you have to carry like a boom box or something <laughs> uh -huh. but on I think it's December 17th it's downtown in Greenwich Village everyone meets at the arch they, they you already download the same track of song and everyone plays it blasting and walks all <laughs> walks through the streets playing the music cool. it's called unsilent night so, Rosalind, I keep hearing about this thing called, what is it, 
ElfCon. Now that's not SantaCon, right? <laughs> no, very different than SantaCon. <laughs> so ElfCon is for families, for children. Um, and very different than SantaCon, it is instead a hot cocoa crawl. So what you can do is register online, um, it's a small donation, and then you can go to different businesses that are participating with your family and get hot cocoa. It's a really sweet event um, and fun for, for kids, honestly kids of all ages. I would do it even as an adult um, without children, but it's, you know, meant for kids. Uh -huh. And the markets, there are markets all over the city, Absolutely, right? yeah. Bryant Park is, of course, really famous, and it just got a designation as one of the best in the world. So you do want to see that one. Union Square also has a great market that I recommend checking out as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's going to have to do it. Lots of good stuff. I can't wait to visit as many as possible. And when you finish all that stuff, well, you got New Year's to do. So lots of stuff out there. I want to thank our guests for steering us through all that the city has to offer this holiday season. Historian Mike Michonne, Lori Pickhart from Free Tours by Foot NYC, and Queensboro Community College history professor Tim Keogh, and Rosalind Colgan from Time Out New York Magazine. Thank you for joining us, and happy holidays from all of us here at CUNY TV. I'm Mike Gilliam. We'll see you next time on A Slice of New York. Happy holidays from A Slice of New York.